<laughs> okay, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Peter Buckingham. I am the Managing Director of Spectrum Analysis, as many of you may know. I'm going to open by saying that you need to look at this topic as really an investment in your school. If you look at this as an expense and, oh, we can't afford it, well, in the big picture, most of the schools we deal with would spend half a million dollars on people involved in admissions, involved in uh, different functions within the school, marketing, and really they need data to make good decisions. So our expertise at Spectrum Analysis is using data to make better business decisions. And as you may know, we don't only do schools, we do a lot of other work as well. So just that's our motto and that's what we try to stick to. So my plan today, and I'm just reading notes to start with, is to briefly discuss data that's available for schools, demonstrate how you can look at it online in an online system. Now, whether you use one that we've already set up or something else, that's your call, but this is the sort of data that's available. You can be the judge on that. Look at some of the things we like to cover when we do a, de a geodemographic analysis for schools. And then we'll take any questions either via Sue Elson, who is uh, assisting me and helps with our marketing, or at the end, if you so desire. So I'm gonna bring up my uh, slideshow and we will start off with that. Okay. So what does analysis cover? So we can look at a lot of things. Schools have many different functions and the type of analysis we do or recommend be done, firstly gives some big picture. Are we ever looking at another site, another campus, greenfields? Are we thinking of major expenditure? What's the area gonna be like in years to come? And maybe we're even playing with uh, early learning centers and maybe the school needs to understand better what is the young uh, population coming at them? Or do we actually go and buy or open our own ELC? For an operations point of view, enrolments, how and where are we doing our marketing? How do we try and work out what is our, I'll call it our market share? What are the numbers we're getting out of an area compared to what's available? And what's gonna be available in the future? This is really major things schools need to be working on if they're planning to expand or even stay stable. And look, we will show you a CARA data in a little while and we can see every school, what it is from 2008 till now. And look, some schools are down 10, 20%. And they're the ones that really do need to understand their problem and do something about it. The last, one of the other things we find very valuable is buses. We can map every bus line, we can actually show which children are on the bus. Therefore, we can show which ones aren't on the bus. Sometimes it might be a simple investment. You may have a 25 seat bus with 10 kids on it. Just by getting that up by another five or 10 children would make a huge difference to obviously the, the value of the bus. So finally, we like to think of strategy as not a wet finger in the air approach or not just a random thought. But strategy is really the long-term view for the school going forward, not based on guesstimates and ideas, but based on facts and data. So that's really our main uh, point of where we go with Spectrum. So I first want to talk about data that's readily or that is available. I'll say readily, it is public data. Uh, what you always find these days with public data is huge tables, huge Excel spreadsheets. What we're all about is helping make that much more easy to see and understand. And that's why I'm gonna show a little bit further how it looks when it's in a web mapping system and how quickly and easy it is to see stuff and make your own decisions. I'll just also push on saying that when we do projects, analysis projects for schools, as much as we will give some ideas and thoughts of what should happen, a lot of what we're doing is helping the school understand what's readily available and making it accessible so that they can, in an ongoing way, make better business decisions based on the facts and data, not just not know where to get the data. So the things that I'm going to show you today include 
socioeconomic index for areas, and that's a quasi for uh, average household income. Uh, the census data we've pulled out of the census from 2016 and 2021 of numbers and including even ethnicity and religion, which is often very critical to schools. Uh, there is census data from 2021 and previously about what type, what number of children are in the area and whether they go to government school, Catholic school or independent school. And we can see therefore what's likely to go forward and what market share we can look at getting and how that market share ties in with the socioeconomics of the area. We have the ABS population projections. Now the ABS in their cycle of five year cycle come out with population projections. The last one was delivered in October, 2019. And that is their projections from 2017 to 2032. That's as far as the ABS is prepared to go in small areas. And I'll talk about those areas going forwards. And we find that the gold medal data that every school should be looking at. And uh, it's no real value looking at certain state-based data or even council data. Let the experts do it. That's what the ABS are paid to do. And they're the ones that get the data in from all the other sources to come up with their best estimates going forward. We also have access, or you, everyone has access to my school's data and the ACARA data. And that's really valuable to look at what is happening and what's been happening for the last, well, we go back to 2008 and look at your numbers for every school in Australia, how many pupils they've had since 2008 till 2021. We are eagerly awaiting the 2022 data, which is normally comes out in March. And that'll give us a better picture going forward. The last one with the crazy uh, set of letters in front of it is the quality assurance that works for early learning. So this is the data set of 17,000 early learning centres and kindergartens and daycares that is held by the, uh, by the government, even telling us how many places, registered places and what their rating is in the system for quality control. So my point to you is this is data that's all readily available to schools. How you get to it or whether you want to go and do it yourselves and look it up one one Excel spreadsheet at a time is your call. We're going to show you how it can be done in a much easier way. The second thing we use in our geodemographic analysis is your data. So you might not realise what you've actually got. But the first thing is most schools will be able to show the 2021 student data. And now we're obviously working on 2023. We also often ask if they're available to go to 2016. Now, you might recognise that 2016 and 2021 were census years. So when we're talking about things like market share, and we can say these are how many children you had out of that area compared to how many were available to go to independent school or Catholic school or government school, we can do a much better market share if we're actually using the same year for the denominator and the numerator. But we use 2023 as well because we have to be as current as possible but it depends what schools have. And when we're looking at that data, we want ideally date of birth, the address, the feeder school, where the child came from before they came to you, what year they're in, and uh, they're, they're the really important things we're looking at. Then we get to, sorry, I just wanted to drop that. Oh, and obviously, sorry, the last thing is very important is school buses. We are very good at mapping which children are on the bus, which ones aren't on the bus, so that your bus coordinator can then help make some decisions. Do we move the route a little bit to get to more kids? Do we actually get on the phone and ring some parents and say, do you realise the bus runs at the end of your street? And meanwhile, your kid's getting to school some other way. I'll let you be the judge on how that works. But when you've got the data and the information and a visual to show you where the bus is and where the kids live, it becomes much easier. Future enrolments. Again, you have data on date of birth, address of the feeder school, if knowing where the child's going to come from, what year of admission, what class year they're going to come into. Very good in your forward planning. And I guess it's a question like, how far ahead do we look? 
Well, I did a school yesterday that has about 1,400 students and they already have over 1,300 on their, their list. So that's pretty healthy. I'm sure if I asked Scotch College in Melbourne that they'd probably have 8,000 on their list. As he once told me, their biggest problem is managing disappointment and telling people they're not going to get in. Lucky position to be in. But most schools want to know, and we even can map that year by year to see where the 2024 children, 2025, et cetera, are going to come from. If data is available, we're happy to always uh, map alumni. And the only real value I see is if you have a very strong uh, program, maybe you're with someone like Alan Grow or people like that that help build a proper process up, then what we're trying to do is give you a visual to see where the old, old boys and old girls are. Maybe if you're someone like Halebury, it helps make a decision where you hold the annual old boys, old girls dinner when you've got about five different, uh, five different campuses here in Melbourne. But the alumni is just a good thing to be able to see and get some feel of where they now are. Again, I talk on bus routes. The information you have is your bus routes. We obviously can plug into that other bus routes and train routes and get a good picture of what the, uh, what the transport options are for you and whether you need to think about other bus routes as well. The last thing, if you're a boarding school, we'll always like to look at uh, current data, where the current borders are coming from, where the future borders are going to come from based on any lists you have, and help with a bit of thinking about the strategy and the marketing to keep those borders numbers up. Obviously, a lot of people have been down compared to having international borders in the last couple of years. Whether that returns or not, I'm not the one to say. Okay, so what I want to do now is show you a lot of these things in a mapping interface. Just for your information, you can actually uh, grab this um, grab this link and jump on it or copy it into your browser and you can then use one of these examples we've made and the one we call is Gels Park or Gels College. It is a school that doesn't exist. We've limited it to only about a five or six kilometre around the area. So if you happen to be hunting tower or someone like that that's right nearby, you get a bit of a free kick because you can see the data, but most schools probably can't uh, do it. But you'll see the examples now of what we can look at as far as data is concerned. Okay, let me just bring that up. Okay, hopefully we're looking at a map. And the very simple way our mapping works is we have a legend and a layer. The others are pretty irrelevant. So the legend allows us at any point to go back in and check something like right now I've got the CIFA layer on, socioeconomic index for areas. We can see that the top 20%, then the next 20% through the different colour schemes. So the only point of the legend is really, if in doubt, go and have a quick look. And I'll talk about this a bit further, but this is the code we use to look at the 17,000 early learning centres that we now have in our system. The most important is layers. And quite simply, our system works on, if it's blue, it's on. So I'm just bringing up the school itself by turning that on. And if it's grey, it's off. So the school will now have disappeared. At the moment, I've got on layers of independent schools, Catholic schools, and CIFA. So let's start from the beginning. First place people often want to know is what their school's doing and what is others around it. So let me start by saying, and I'm just picking straight out the school. Okay, I've got a very small school there. Let me go to something a bit more powerful. Uh, I'm just going to pick up PLC. So this is Presbyterian Ladies College in Melbourne. What we're able to see is how many students they had in 2008, right through to how many students now in 2021. Data's readily available. We will put 2022 in very soon. We're able to see how many students, how many equivalent full-time teaching staff they have, and how many uh, full-time non-teaching staff. Now, 
This is something if you're a Somerset school, you probably already do some benchmarking, but you may want to benchmark yourself against your main competitors. And one of the things you can look at is uh, students per teacher or te yeah, students per teacher and teaching and non-teaching staff. Second thing in here, again, this is a number from uh, my schools. Every school has to submit data to the government and they put in an approximate and average student uh, fee. And how they do it is they look at what the contributions are, the fees, they put it all into one basket, divide by the number of students and then come up with this number. We're not saying it's an exact number, but what it is, is an indicator. It's a good idea when you're comparing to other schools of approximately where you sit. Now, the other little feature we've got in here is every school's website. So if I do want to go and look at a school's fees, I can very quickly just jump on their website and probably within about a minute, I could probably jump through here and find where their fees are and go and have a detailed look at it. So we can see that every school in Australia, there's over nine or 10,000 schools are here. And how we look at them is by uh, ICARA data, and I can bring up every government school as well. They're the little green dots, Catholic school are the red dots, and the independent schools are the purple dots. That's the first thing we'll leave open. Second thing I'm going to touch on is CIFA. Now, CIFA is Socioeconomic Index for Areas. And I'll come out in Melbourne a bit further. And how we do it from the code is quite simply the, guess what, all of independent schools tend to be in the dark blue areas, which is the top 20% of CIFA, or a fair majority. The next colour scheme is the light blue, then the white, then the pink, and then the brown. Now, every score, Mr and Mrs Average in Australia, as I'll show you a bit further on, uh, lives at a score of 1,004. You think of a bell curve, one standard deviation to the good side is 1,100, two standard deviations, 1,200, same on the downside. So we can actually go to any area and see what is their population and what is their CIFA score. So this is that second range, 1065. If I go to Park Orchards, it's higher, 1103. If I go into sort of the highest ones in Melbourne are actually probably, uh, I think it's uh, the Surrey Hills West at 1147, and it actually jumps above Turek. Now, Turek might not be happy to hear that, but according to the ABS, uh, Surrey Hills is uh, slightly higher, or the areas around there. So we can look at CIFA across every area, and I'm just going to show you for interstate people, this works all over. I can jump straight up to Sydney. Here's Sydney. As you may expect, here come all the CIFAs. Okay, there they are. And that's the CIFA areas in Sydney. And if I go to dear old, uh, to take me out to Vaucluse, 1166. So it, it trumps uh, Melbourne's best one. And some of the other areas like Neutral Bay, 1148. Okay, we'll stay in Sydney, why not? The next thing we'll bring up is the new data we've put on, which is the CEQA data. So I might just get rid of all of the uh, schools, the independent schools, turn them off. Now, of course, there's thousands of these. These are early learning centres. So what it can tell us, I can just pick one cold. The little, if I'm wondering what all the little squares are, I only have to go back to our legend. Go to here and I can see that if it's adult, a long daycare centre, it's going to have green square on the top. If it's a kindergarten that's part of a school, it'll have a blue square on the side. And if it's a kindergarten that's a standalone, it'll have a blue square on that side. And if it's part of a sort of a daycare, uh, out of hours thing, it'll be one of the ones on the bottom. Now, I can actually refine that. And let's say I just want to go and look at all of the long daycare centres. They've now come up. I can pick one and it's going to tell me who runs it, where they are, even their phone number, how many approved places they have, and how they're standing in this NQS, which is the National Quality Standards. Now, they're not probably the greatest one I picked, picked at random. They're working towards NQS. 
not, not the best recommendation. I'll pick one here, our Greenacre Montessori, 48 places, exceeding NQS. That's what you want to see. So we can look at, on the other hand, we can then jump to ones that are uh, a kindergarten that is part of a school. Can we come up? Okay, so I like we're doing it that way. Let's just go back to the layers. Stick in Melbourne. Maybe we haven't loaded that all of Australia and just loaded it for this example. So long daycare kindergarten with the green cross, green squares, as I mentioned. If I want to see one that's part of a school, this one over here, part of Hunting Tower, exceeding NQS only has 25 places. And if I want to see standalone kindergartens, the ones that are on their own that are good targets for the future, I can obviously pull them up being the blue squares, blue square on the right. So this now gives you a real way of looking around your area or any area at what the kindergartens and schools are that are around there. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is census data. What we've done or we've done, but you can go look at census, you can use quick stats, you can use whatever you like. We've done it this way. So I'm going to use Mount Waverley as an example. So the first thing is we're looking at what Mount Waverley looked like in 2016 that's relevant to schools. So we've got this purple colour. We can see the population. We can see the average household income. We can see the percentages of people at different age groups. We've then put in how many from the census, we know how many preschool, primary school and secondary school, boys or girls go to government, Catholic or independent school for that area. And we can also see that as a percentage, which is quite interesting. So this area is only 11% of, uh, in, of all children available at primary go to an independent school and 23.3% at secondary. If I move into somewhere like Turak, I'll see, or Port Clouse, I'll probably see up near 80%. The last thing we've put in here for comparison is language spoken at home. When we think ethnicity, we now find that if you're looking at some ethnicity, you're finding now a lot of people are second, third generation Australian. The Vietnamese that came out in the 70s, and by now the kids are second, third generation. Uh, the Italians, the Greeks that came out in the in the 60s and 50s. So probably the best indicator of the ethnicity of an area is language spoken at home. Now, this area here is 21% Chinese, about 6% Indo-Aryan, so Indian and Pakistani and a few of those languages, not much Arabic, and about 17% non-English, which is going to be your Italians, your Greeks. We can go into this in much more detail, but it's just an indicative starting point. So that's what was there in Mount Waverley in 2016. And all we have to do is jump across to 2021, go back to our same area. And now we're looking at the comparative numbers three years later, uh, five years later. So the Chinese is now at 25%. And you can see that uh, the other English is now down to 14. And what I want, if I'm wanting to look and do a comparison, I just do an easy thing of copy paste that onto some spreadsheet or just onto a Word document and then just copy and paste uh, the 20, the other one, the 2016 or the 20, whichever one I want to look at and put the two side by side and I can very quickly look at the different areas. So if I'm wanting to look at a much higher socioeconomic, I might come up to that Surrey Hills I mentioned. And we're starting to see numbers like 57% going to independent school secondary, 21% going to independent school primary. And if I take that to a more lower socioeconomic area, just going to pick, sorry if I offend anyone, Knoxfield, Scoresby, I'm still seeing in the 20% and 20 11%. Uh, and again, I'm, I can see very much I've got a high Chinese population and a high uh, a reasonable Indian population. So that is a way of looking at the census data for any area across Australia. 
or wherever you want to be. Okay, the next one I'm just going to touch on is the population projection. Now, this is the most important in my view, or one of the most important that we can look at. So I'm just going to turn off the census and I'm back to pretty much nothing. So the first thing is total population. So the very nice people at the ABS gave us projections out to 2032 by age, 0 to 5, 0 to 4, 5 to 9, 10 to 14, et cetera. So we have already done a little bit of cutting and say 0 to 5 is probably preschool. Five to uh, six to about 12 is primary school. I think we've done 13 to 18 is secondary school and work on from there. So the first thing we can do is we can just pick an area in total population and we can see whether it's going to grow or not. So Mount Waverley South, 21,000 in 2022, expected to be about 24,000 in uh, 2032, 3,000 more people or 14%. Now, you do get sometimes areas like Juan Turner. These are the areas I describe as where the whole residence were built 30 or 40 years ago. No new houses have gone in. Mum and dad are still there. Probably had four kids. They've all moved on. And the population can actually be dropping in some cases. Well, this one isn't dropping, but it's only growing 124. So if I go and look at one like, I think, Mill Park, Yes, it's actually going to drop 116 kids. So anyone thinking of opening a new uh, school, I wouldn't bother about Mill Park South and Mill Park North. So I can then look at the high growth. And so this is total population. We can go across and I'll just show you a run or two spectaculars. Might be Truganina in Melbourne, 43,000 to 74,000, up 31,000. And Tarnit's going to grow another 24,000. But you're involved with schools, so that doesn't really worry you. You're much more interested to know what the school population is going to do, the number of kids. So let me now show you what that's going to look like, and I'll stick around this Burwood area about my uh, so the example, because if you want to play with our Jones Park, this is where it will be. So I look at Mount Waverley, Mount Waverley South, and it's going to increase by about, so we start off by 0 to 4s, it'll 152 kids, uh, preschool, 5 to 11, primary school, about 267, and about 301 secondary. So it is an area that's growing roughly 14%. Now, you can see our colour scheme. If we jump to look at our colour scheme, we can see pretty quickly down here that we tend to go from population highest to green through to brown lowest. So let's now be thinking of if we're opening schools. We might be thinking of opening a campus in Roseville. Well, I wouldn't be thinking that's a great idea because we're, the government are actually predicting we will have about 50 students less in Roseville in 10 years' time than what we've got now. So not a high, high area. Let me take you and show you again one or two of the high growth ones. And for the Melbourne people, I'll just use Truganina. So it's going to grow about 8,000 additional children and Tarnit is going to grow another 6,000 additional children. So that, I'll oh, throw Wyndham Vale in for another 3,000. They need about you know, 16, 17,000 additional kids just out of those three areas. So you can see it probably needs 10 or 15 more schools. To give you a quick heads up for the Sydney siders, I'm just going to walk us back up to Sydney as quickly as we can. I'll give you a quick look at Marsden Park. This is the Marsden Park growth corridor. It's going to go up 11,000 kids additional just in the next 10 years. Just on 11,500. Throw onto that another 3,000 at uh, Castlereagh Cranebrook, you can get the effect of where some of the big growth corridors of Sydney are. The other very big one, of course, is uh, if we look at Badgerys Creek, which is the new airport we've all heard about, 2,000 in Austral Greendale, another 9,000 in Cobbety Levington, and I think I recall there's still a few more, nearly 2,500 there. So Sydney's big growth corridors are here in Marston Park. Okay, so you can see that we can look at growth 
and the future in a very easy sort of manner. Okay, the next one I'm going to bring to us is uh, just to give a quick look at some religious type things. We've mapped, again, Australia-wide, Anglican, Catholic, uh, Christianity, Islamic, and give you some ideas. I'll start with the Christian ones. This is Anglican, probably the sort of down south of uh, George's River, what's the George's River, just around this, the Shire. So what we're able to see is how many people said in 2016 they were Christianity Anglican, how many people reported their religion, so we're only trying to deal with people that actually put something down, and that was showing at 20.1% for that area. In 2021, it's dropped to 15%. But this was an Australia-wide thing where people reported far less religion than they had. So we can actually see the change in the five years of what's happening. As you might, anyone who knows the South uh, Sydney will know that probably the southern suburbs, northern suburbs are probably the more religious Christian. If I'm wanting to go and have a look at the Islamic population, then I'm much more into the southwest suburbs. And I think, as I recall, if I can pick up somewhere like Makemba, uh, I can be hitting up in the sort of 70%. I'm just going to live where I am. Uh, probably a bit to the Roselands. I'm getting 20%. So you, you get some pretty high percentages in some of these Sydney areas. Uh, I was going to just try and pick where my memory of where Makemba is, Green Acre up near here. So they're 45% uh, at uh, Islamic. So don't bother trying to open an extra Catholic school in the area. So again, uh, it was interesting somewhere we worked recently and they, uh, Hindu is probably a pretty good quasi for Indian people. Again, you'll get fairly strong Indian numbers often in these outer suburbs, and it's 10, well, you can see it's six, gone from 9.9% to 16.3%, people saying they're of uh, Hindu. So it starts to give a fairly good indication of what the religions are in these areas. So we've got all those mapped through. Okay, so what I want to do now is hopefully whether you use something we've created or whether you go into the Excel spreadsheets or how you get it to your choice. I often tell people to look up quick stats, Q-U-I-K-S-T-A-S. That'll take you into the ABS website and you can look up any postcode, any suburb, but you've got to work your way through it. That's, uh, that's the reason we've created these sort of tools, obviously, is to help you uh, do it in a better way. Okay, I'm just going to bring my screen back up. Okay, so as I've said earlier, analysis is using data to make better business decisions. Many different parts of the school can, can do that. And what we've done, and I'm just going to leave you because you'll all get the slides. If you wish to have a look at one we have created, which is the fake Gels College, so don't anybody get on their horse that I'm giving away trade secrets. We actually made this school up and put, and you might even recognise some people's names besides some of the names of the kids, just because I did. The net effect of all of that is uh, you can go in and have a play and have a look yourself. Just pick that up and stick it in your browser and it'll show you Dell's College or click on it and it'll get you there. So... I want to just go through some slides that are typical of the type of analysis work we do. So this is from our GELS College example. Uh, typical project instruction, map out the kids, 2023, 2021 and 2016. Map out all the future enrolments and the alumni. Penetration analysis or market share. Let's look at our students compared to the denominator. So our student numbers for any area can be the numerator, the denominator can be either purely independent schools or all non-government schools, which would be Catholic and independent together. And that's often an interesting discussion about how many kids at Catholic school are now Catholic 
who represent themselves as Catholic in the census are possibly going to the independent or Anglican type of schools. And even the other way, I was talking to a Catholic school that call themselves a Catholic school, and they believe now they're about 10% Catholic and the rest are independent. So my suggestion was to call themselves a, a Christian school and they didn't really want to do that, but it doesn't matter why. Um, we obviously will then be comparing the demographic trends 2021 and 2016 against the student numbers. Uh, define primary and secondary catchment areas. Where do the most of your kids come from? Our normal definition of that is about 80, 85% of your school kids. How far out do we have to get to get to about 80, 85%? I like to think really strong schools, that's nice and tight. It means you are very strong in your area. If it's really loose and a long way to have to go, then you're obviously grabbing kids everywhere from all different areas. Um, provide possible new areas for marketing based on demographics and low market share or low penetration. Where should we be thinking of marketing into the future? I'll often say marketing can be, I'm not one to get involved in your uh, online marketing. Other people can play that game. I say marketing can be as simple as, let's imagine the principal said, we're gonna put 10 bus shelters out there, um, typical bus shelter of advertising our school. Where are we gonna put them and why? And I'll combine that with where do our buses run? And even if there could be a couple of them could be in areas we're not really into yet, but they're really big growth corridors and we're planning to start a bus running up there in the next couple of years, maybe our marketing lead the charge by putting a couple of bus shelters out there and get people new, coming soon, bus to our school. Again, I don't have, I'm not Steve Vizard with the uh, little ponytail at the back of the head. Do you remember him from his good old days? All I'm saying is we want to use information to make those decisions better than just red finger in the air. So when we look at our current bus routes and make recommendations for possible new bus routes or moving of our bus routes, they're pretty much our general instructions we're doing on most projects we're asked to play with. Now in our demo, we will normally have uh, our, what we'll call the major catchment area and the minor catchment area. And we'll probably have in this case, probably 80% of the pupils are coming from in here and another 10% from here. Then you find the ones for another reason. Could be that the parent teachers of the school and obviously little John or Jilly come in with mum and dad to, to the school every day. It could be that it's an old boy or some reason that they wanted their kids specifically at the school. Don't know. But what we're really trying to show is where we really should be marketing hard because that's our prime catchment area. In this example, I believe, I think we've got two different uh, campuses and we're quite often dealing with schools that have more than one campus. In fact, one, the ones we have done, we've almost had to do two separate projects because the school could have one campus in near the city and one in the outer. And this is what some of these big schools are doing now. I'll use examples like Xavier. Well, Xavier, no, they used to have one out and they sort of uh, closed down one, but the likes of Wesley in Melbourne, uh, Ivanhoe Grammar in Melbourne and Caulfield Grammar have all gone to having inner and another campus outside. Second thing we like to do is have a look at our major and minor catchment area and get, get the thinking. So how many people live there? How many five to 18s? What's that the percentage of the population? How do we benchmark that against our minor catchment area, Greater Melbourne, Victoria, total Australia? Now we can see in this area, uh, 14, then we can look at what is the population growth going to be? Now in our minor catchment, it's, in our major catchment, it's 14.7%. The minor catchment a bit further out, it's about 39%. Melbourne in general is growing at about 35%. Australia, 24%. Now, this is really an inner sort of area, which means it's not going to grow nothing like the outer area as well. We can then see what's the growth of five to 18 year olds. Now, again, inner area, saw it a minute ago, uh, inner area of Melbourne. So there's no much new development. There's no new 10 story blocks of flats or anything going in or well, not much. 
So what we've got is not a big growth corridor there, but it's still growing 15%. But our CIFA, socioeconomics 1023, the minor catchment's a little under average. Melbourne's average is 1024, so it's pretty much on average with Melbourne. Victoria 1010, Australia 1004. And just to give us a feel of remembering we've done some work for others on uh, fee elasticity, where does the fee sort of lie compared to average household income and compared to CIFA? No good trying to think you're going to charge $30,000 a year in an area that's of a CIFA of 900 or 920. And uh, I guess if you've got your campuses in really top areas, you're not going to probably be trying to charge, you know, $2,000 a year if your campuses are in Hawthorne or Double Bay or places like that. But this just gives us an indication. What's the age profile, the average age? And we've just thrown in here the sort of Catholic, the Islamic. We can add many other things depending on what we're dealing with. <clears throat> the next thing, as I've mentioned, we like to talk about is the CIFA. Have the CIFA showing compared to the current students. In this little example, we even mapped in different colours, kinder, prep, primary and secondary. And while I like to show it as part of a PowerPoint presentation, we really do find we can demonstrate it better using the web-based mapping because then we can come right in, we can actually see students, students' names and things like that. But again, when we do a full presentation, I did a presentation yesterday, our slide pack was just over 100 PowerPoint slides. Now, the idea being have everything in it, business manager, the admissions, whoever's in charge, they can cut it down to what they need. They might end up only using 10 slides as a board presentation, probably 30 slides for an executive group presentation, but they know they've got it all there and it's very easy to work with PowerPoint. So this gives us an idea again, from a marketing point of view, where we've got potential, we can light up where the other schools are of our competitors. The next slide we look normally will play with a bit is uh, our future students. So we've just thrown in an imaginary group of future students. And then what we are able to do, as I said, is measure for each area. What is the number of students we're going to have or we've got enrolled on our books compared to how many are available? It tells us pretty quickly that, yes, we're getting good bang for our buck across our area here. We're getting a bit reasonable across the light green areas. We're not getting much in the others. And where it's, uh, where it's white, we're getting none. So we're getting very few students out of uh, none from Listerfield South, Doveton, but we're getting some still from some of these other areas. But this is a major. We then like to throw up, uh, just to explain, SA2 is when Australia does a census. We have SA1s, of which there are roughly 57,000. We then have SA2s, of which are about 2,300. And just by comparison, there's about 2,600 postcodes. A lot of cases in capital cities, the postcode and the SA2 line up. What we do is we just like to give you a, a visual so you can see what areas are what when we're talking names and can flip back to them. So if you want to know where Roeville South and Roeville Central, you'll be able to work it out pretty well with the map. The most important thing we see, as I mentioned, is what is the student population going to look like in the next 10, 15 years? Now, because the data actually started in 2017, in a lot of the earlier projects, we left 2017 through to 2021. Now we're probably just showing 2022 or 2023 up to 2032, because that's what you're interested in. What's the estimated population now? And what's the estimated population in 2022? So I can see Burwood East. It's going to go from 1807 to this little thing to 2239. So we can see it's going to go up about 400 more pupils. On the other hand, some areas might be going down. Just trying to remember this area. No, they're all pretty much up, but oh, small amounts, not, nothing big. So there's growth in the area. So we will normally show you the numbers to start with and then the percentages. But there's no good jumping around saying, oh, this area is going to grow 100%. Yeah, it's going to go from 100 kids to 200. I'm more interested in something that's going to grow 20% from 3,000 to 3,600, where the bigger numbers are. But you can just toggle back and forth and look at the area 
that Burwood one from 2017 to 2032 is going to go 32%. And I guess now and now more later, things will probably just be showing 2022 to 2032. But it means we can look at every area around us and get a clear understanding of what the ABS are expecting. The ABS, as I said, to me are the gold medal councils or go to Tasmania. They always predict they'll grow by about 6% in a five-year census and then they end up growing 4%. It's always been the same. They over-predict. Victoria, even states, it's in their political interest to do it. The ABS are chartered to be fair and across all states. Again, just with our simple colour, right? the top areas in this little example here, over here in Knoxfield, where our Gels College imaginary is, there's not much growth immediately around it, bit up at Forest Hills, bit back in at Burwood, and this bit of a corridor on the east, which to the uh, west of them that has been quite a development thing, basically on the eastern side of uh, Warrigal Road to Huntingdale Road over the years. So the point is, you can see it, you can visualise it. We then like to have a little go at uh, what are your school versus the other schools from 2008 to 2021 now. This hasn't been brought up for that. And very soon we'll have it to 2022. Because you want to know, how have you gone? So at Imaginary Gels College had gone from 610 to 735, uh, Mazano 1168 to 1444, uh, Hunting Tower 535 up to 720. And I'm just trying to see, I can't see under something here. Just to move it down. Yep. So I'm just seeing whether anyone's gone down. Yes, uh, St Justin's Wheelers Hill has actually gone from 354 to 336. Now, don't be surprised, there are schools that are going down. Uh, one we're dealing with at the moment, uh, I'll just say it's a Catholic school, it is going down. But when you look at all of its nominated feeder schools that are around it, they're all down 25% each over the last eight or 10 years. Well, guess what? They're a secondary Catholic school. And when your feeder schools are down 25%, that's going to have to rub off, makes it very hard to pick up. Again, we have in that web-based mapping every school, so you can look at every primary school, the ones nearby, the ones you get your most from, and see if they're going up or going down. Uh, maybe they're going down and you're going up. Well, aren't you good? That's fantastic. So in our little example here, we have all of what is nominated as the main competitors. Uh, future enrolment uptake. Again, where the kids are going to be coming from. It looks like we've done it down to smaller areas here. Because uh, it's a ABS data, we can actually go down to SA1, so 57,000 SA1s, if we really get the urge to go that low. SA2s are the population projection data. SA1s are the census data. SA1s all fit into SA2s. The next thing we just like to show is bus routes. We can put all the bus routes. It starts to help us get a bit of a visual on where are their potential students. Maybe the bus route needs to move a little bit, go up a different road. Again, when we do the web-based mapping with our main clients, now we actually map which kids are on the bus and which ones aren't. So you can actually go in really closely and ask the bus coordinator to let some uh, parent know that their year 10 boy or girl happens to be right near the bus and why they bother driving. So bus routes are great to see and make some serious decisions. We've had cases uh, or heard of cases where they finally asked the bus driver what he did and he started at point A, then he went to point B and he picked up the first few kids and away he went. They said, well, how long since you picked up a kid at point A, where you start? Oh, about three or four years. So no bus, nobody had got on the bus for some years because that nobody has sort of kept a track on it. I'll leave you to be the judges on that. The next thing we have, we have drive time data. And we like to just throw up simple thing, five minute, 10 minute, 15 minute and 20 minute. This is estimates, but it's done through uh, a company out of Germany. We find it very accurate. It just helps you sort of decide if I'm gonna market into an area, it's no point going crazy about an area over here that's 20, 25 minutes away where I can, get a better bang from a buck somewhere that might be 10 or 15 minutes away because 
the end of the day, if I was a child, I wouldn't be that wrapped if my parents were putting me on a bus for an hour, an hour and a bit each way. I talk to roll call. They tell me the average, especially in Sydney and Melbourne, is about 40 minutes on a bus each way. Uh, I don't think that sounds like much fun to me, but uh, I was different type of uh, when I went to school. Last thing I'm going to bring up here is borders. A lot of you may have borders. We like to do some analysis on the borders, where they come from previously, where they're coming from now. We actually use a variable called number of families with two parents working and earn over $100,000 a week as a quasi ideal of the most likely for getting borders. I remember when we did a school over in Western Australia, the principal used to go out into the west, uh, out to the east, out into the wheat field area. We made some suggestions. And unless I'm wrong, she now does an occasional trip up towards the northwest shelf, up to Karatha and those areas, because we showed there are more people, double income, both parents working over 100 grand up there than there are out in the sort of wheat belt of WA. And I guess if I was looking at Victoria, there are uh, Riverina areas a good potential, whereas down Moey and Terrelgan probably is not such a good, good way. But we can look at that sort of data. So what value can we achieve? Hopefully what we've learned a bit about is understanding and mapping where current students come from, understanding where future students are coming from or can get that data. We can identify future growth areas and where to market. For schools, we can do bus routes and you can do it yourselves, play around with Google all you like and make, some, uh, make sure they're effective. And I always say understanding available information equals making informed decisions. So on that note, I'm going to uh, shut down for a minute and take any questions and hopefully help anybody in any way we can. Thank you, Peter. Lots of information there. And Tina and David have had to move on. They had some other webinars to attend to. But we oh. do have one question from Mel. Uh, she wanted to know what CIFA was, which we I mentioned was Socioeconomic Index for Areas. But she also has received a report for December in 2022. And she yep. wants to know if her data through Spectrum is updated with the 2023 information from February, or is that locked in some way? No, no, we, we with schools we deal with, we normally have major project we do. Mm -hmm. And then we like to every year do an annual update of your data. Now, Van in our office will be sending out to you. Um, Mel, I'm not sure which school you're with, but I'll, I'll work that out in a minute, I'm sure. The point is, our view of how schools should operate is a main competitor tends to get you to try and do something every year and charges you, I'm going to say 20 grand. It's not up to me what they do. We believe you should do one of these main projects probably every five years. And some of our best schools like Knox Grammar, they sometimes do it every three and two or three years. But anyone who knows Knox Grammar knows it's the biggest one in Australia. So that's their choice. And we love them for that. But we like schools to do it probably every five years. And then every year we update the data and the mapping. We put in your current students, 2023. We update all your future students. We will update your bus routes, which kids are on the bus, which ones aren't. We will update all of the data we're responsible for that I mentioned to start, ACARA, ASEQA, uh, CIFA when it comes available. This year, we've just put in all of that census data so you can see two years. So that's our responsibility. And we normally have a contract for three or five years to do that with you. And the point is over a five-year cycle of what we do, we believe it's about a, I'll say a forty to $50,000 a year uh, over five years. So let's say an average of eight or 10 grand to have all this data available, have one really big analysis done at the beginning, get everybody on board and have everybody swimming in the same direction. And that's what we're trying to do and doing that fairly successfully with a lot of big schools. As I said, ones like Knox Grammar, they've chosen because a certain gentleman there is about to retire. He actually wants it done at a two-year interval. So we did them last two years ago and Martin wants it done now. That's a commitment they've already made then they'll probably settle back at their three or four yearly update that they've already done. 
Uh, we just, because we really moved heavily on schools starting around 2018, 2019, we're now getting to that five year stage for some of the early ones we did. And we're hoping to sort of talk them around of having another go. And all of our mapping, our whole projects changed. When we started this, we'd give them a report that was that thick. Martin Gooding at uh, Knox, he said, Peter, when I told him we do it now by doing a, uh, doing it all on PowerPoint, he got out his things out of the drawer and he said, Peter, you don't know how happy I am. He said, when I get your reports, I'm the only one that's ever read them. I then spend the next three days turning it into a PowerPoint that I can go and show the headmaster. He was wrapped when he heard that we were going to do the hard work. We keep now asking people if they want a hard copy, a really big report, we'll do it. We'll charge $5,000 extra and we've had no takers. Nobody <laughs> wants that, which I'm very happy to say because it's a pain for us too. So we're really happy to go down this way of doing it all by uh, online mapping system that you can use and we train you in using it with a report once every five years that you can slice and dice and cut and that way you've probably got a long-term sort of for the business manager, you know, an ongoing commitment that may be eight grand over per year over the five years. We're not a bank, so we don't try and fund that. But, you know, you know it might be a 15 or 20 grand job up front and then about three or $4,000 a year to do the five grand a year to do the update of the web, web-based mapping. And we do that with you. At, we're just starting sending our material out now. Hopefully I've answered your question. Yep. Thank you, Peter. And there was another question that came from another client who wanted to put diaries out in schools. And uh, I believe that she wanted the email addresses of the early education and childcare centres. And so uh, one of the GIS analysts at Spectrum was able to get that information and produce lists. So it's another it. aspect. Yes, we made them a list of every, because uh, it's public knowledge, uh, mm -hmm. so we're the first ones to be very protective of uh, confidentiality. So yes, we are able to do that. And I just want to touch on something. We are, every school asks us security, and it came up again yesterday at one. We have a report we've now written for people. Firstly, we now do all our web-based mapping on HTTPS, which means it's more secure than HTTP. Secondly, we're using our own version of two-step authentication. So we're not Google or someone that can do it necessarily through your phone. But when we send you data, we will send you the password for that data in a separate way. So if we're even sending you a, your major report that's all done, Mel or one of my people will send you and we'll put a password on it and we'll send you the password by mobile phone or some other way. And also by being HTTPS, whatever it is, it's apparently stops the middleman hacking of someone getting in between us. Mm -hmm. And we're quite happy when you send data to us to do exactly the same, put it in an Excel spreadsheet, put a password on it if you want, send it, just let us know the password and we'll be happy. So we're trying to be much more conscious of that. And our own data, for example, we actually house our data at Amazon Web Services in Sydney. So nothing when believe you me we're not using a cheap chinese place or anything like that we used to use digital ocean in uh san francisco they're the fourth biggest one in the world we're actually doing aws now and i because my son is right involved he went to the aws international conference in vegas he's coming out in the next month from he lives in america and i'm going to have him do a double check of all of our processes because that is basically what he does and help make sure we've got everything as best we possibly can. We use Trend Micro on all of our machines here. Um, we're, you know, we're, we believe we're at the, at the front edge without being a budget of uh, Mr. Google or someone like that that can do it in a bigger or different way. So happy to discuss that because it always comes up with people and we'll happily take it on. Yeah, the security is a really important issue because if the servers are based in Australia, then the server has to abide by Australian law, which is obviously much more secure than some other countries' law. And Mel's made an additional comment to say, I love that you've separated kinder, primary and high school. It wasn't available when we first looked, so very innovative and exciting. Well done. The other quick thing I'd like to briefly mention, uh, some of the people, 
the people representing schools here today would be participating in the Somerset Financial Survey and there's a mapping product available as part of their Somerset subscription. Would you like to just briefly touch okay, on so that as well? I work closely with John Somerset. We both are data and using things like it. So we've actually made uh, a web-based product that's sitting, you can subscribe to it for about six or seven hundred. $800 a year, just click the box. And that gives you all the things I've shown you, which include the CIFA, the population projections, the ACARA data, the ASEQA data, on, and everything that you want that is not sort of personalised to an individual school. So obviously we haven't got all the people that we work with, Somerset, we don't know their student data and things, and we wouldn't pass that out anyway. So if you are a Somerset school, just have a look at your, um, where you Log in. Yeah. yeah, and you just have to click the box and you can then, it's all set up through John, Australia wide, so it doesn't matter whether you're in Sydney, Melbourne, wherever, you can then go in and look at all of that things like the, the data I just showed at the, earlier in this uh, presentation. And we love people doing it. John and I just came to a conclusion, he really likes you know, probably know he's doing his PhD and it's all about this sort of stuff. And he was so happy to come up with someone that could help visualise it and make it available to his clients uh, at obviously a subscription, but nothing unreasonable. So they can get in and look at the data themselves. Mm -hmm. So please, if you're a Somerset school, go and just have a look and you'll find you can jump onto us through Somerset anyway. Yes, and the other thing is when you work with individual schools, you can tailor specific information. And Stuart Wallace has asked a question about do you show public bus routes as well as the private bus route in the uh, analysis? Yes, we will. If we're doing it for an individual school, we definitely will. Mm -hmm. And we'll show public bus routes and we've also showed trains. Mm -hmm. So some schools we've done recently, they had their own buses. They have some kids come in in private well, two lots. One is just pure private buses. Some like the ones in Melbourne where the Q, they call them the Q buses that come in from Doncaster and they bring kids from different schools and drop off at the different ones like MLC. Look, whatever you've got, we'll map. It's not a problem for us. The beauty is New South Wales. They actually have all the buses on a, uh, on a government website. So we didn't have to draw them all in. That was fantastic. So mm. it was but yeah. we've already got all the railway lines and things in and all the stations. Just and I guess, really yeah, I guess we need to put some tram routes in as well. So there you go. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Stuart Wallace has also asked, would this work for our Dubai campus? Your Dubai campus? Mm -hmm. If you have the data Stuart, from Dubai. We, oh, just to give you an idea, we do F45 trainings mapping worldwide in over 60 countries. So we have data already on places like Dubai, because we're the ones that set up F45's territories across the world. Now, I'm not saying I've got exactly the same data in Dubai as I have in Australia, but believe you me, we can do it, that we could geocode students. There will be census data that probably gives us by age, by area. Let's just say it, it'd be a little bit of a challenge, but it wouldn't cost much different to what we'd normally charge. It's just my um, technical manager would need to have a bit of a look and come back to me about what's available, whether there's public data on every school in Dubai, whether they've got things like the ACARA data with populations going back. I don't know, but I'm really happy to take it on if you want to give me a hoy uh, and just tell us what you're thinking. We can tell you, happy to spend an hour and above, going to happily spend an hour at no cost to see what he can do about getting that sort of data for Dubai. But I know we already have their census data and things because we already have done territories for F45 and some of our other clients like uh, Pino and Picasso. We do Studio Pilates. And these Australian companies are already starting to do territories overseas and we're the ones that set it up for them. Yeah, and we already do quite a lot of information for New Zealand. You went there I, last year. So I went over and spoke daughter. to uh, IS New Zealand conference and we're very comfortable that we can do basically what we do in Australia for New Zealand. Mm. Uh, their data and ours is pretty similar. Look, there's minor things that are just a bit different, but the, the net effect of the whole thing is yeah, the final outputs would be pretty similar. 
Fantastic. All right. Well, uh, I think that's the end of the questions. I haven't had anybody game enough to unmute their microphone and go live. So that's <laughs> Come okay. Come on and talk to me. I, I won't yeah. lie, I promise. Uh, uh, the, I've just popped Peter's email address in the chat, peterb at spectrumanalysis.com.au. You're welcome to follow us on social media. We try and share information that is useful to you. Uh, the security one is a big issue and, and spectrum analysis have had to go through security arrangements for large banks and finance companies and all we, of that we, sort of stuff before. So. We do work for Aussie Home Loans and have mm. for many years. And again, Aussie were owned by Combank. And for us to be able to continue dealing with Aussie, we had to jump through hoops to get Combank's approval mm. to hold the uh, data we needed from Aussie. So even though they've separated out from Combank now, they floated and did things. It was only about two years ago we had to... Uh, write processes and procedures and follow them mm. uh, to meet the Combank guidelines. So it gives you an idea what we've had to jump through for the other side of the business over the years. Yes, and because we're sort of a medium-sized business, we can adjust and adapt and be very agile, as that popular word is, and to adjust to your needs and make sure that we can help you out there. So Tiffany's also said, very informative. Thanks, Peter. So if you would like to save the chat, because I put in a various range of links in the chat, you can click on the three dots and choose Save Chat. That file will be a text file that will appear in your documents slash Zoom folder on your laptop, desktop computer. Uh, as I said, Peter is most happy to chat with you about other information. Uh, Spectrum Analysis is a member of Educate Plus and has provided content to AHESA and what other ones, Peter? Uh, Quite a AHESA, few. ASBA, they want another um, article. Um, we also demonstrated at Catholic Development Network and the Catholic business education, uh, business administrators. So we're sort of hooked up with main, all, all in the independent schools and obviously some of the Catholic network as well. And the Lutheran uh, one too, I think you did. Yeah, as well, we, we demonstrated the Lutheran schools, I uh, think they do every few years, um, hmm. stand there as well. We've done a couple of Lutheran schools. We're doing a couple of Catholic schools at the moment. Obviously, mainly we're doing the independent schools, but we work from big ones in no secret, we do Knox Grammar and Xavier and ones like that. So some smaller ones that might only have two or 300. Uh, we did a Montessori school just recently. We've also done a, uh, a Lutheran school that's in the country. We've done two of those. So, mm. yeah, it's all over the place. But we accommodate and meet our, make our pricing and things meet what's uh, reasonable mm. for that type of school. And can also provide you with some sample data if you'd like that as well. So yeah, look, uh, our website's got a lot of stuff on it. You only have to go to Spectrum Analysis, Education Analysis in our website. Play to your heart's content. There's all sorts of things there. And Sue's very good at sending all sorts of things out. And she works <laughs> with us in making sure it's all available. Good. So thank, thank you, you so much for uh, tuning in. And uh, great to see so many people still at one o'clock. It wasn't the normal jump off like it often is or it's especially okay. you know five past 12 when I was worried you'd all jump off so <laughs> thank you very much for uh, sharing your time with me and uh, we look forward to being in touch in any way you want to in the future yeah great thank, thank you. you Monica thank you Mal thank you Tiffany we'll all see you next time bye for now bye